right, so uh, my name is Bernie Carl. I'm an Imagineer, which happens to be the same thing as an entrepreneur on steroids. I offered to buy the towers. I offered to pay to fix the damn tower. We do things all over the state. I've actually done stuff all over the world. Money is a tool, but money isn't the, isn't the end to everything. I'm motivated by making the planet a better place to live. It's a great motivator. Our vision when we bought this place was to turn it into a sustainable society. And to do that, you have to grow your own food, you have to make your own energy, you have to heat all your buildings. We have, on average, about 80 people working here year-round. We all live here, we all work here, that's kind of the rule. Summertime is a little bit slower than uh, the winter. The wintertime, it's crazy, crazy busy. That's a lot of people in the middle of nowhere. Lots of previous owners of that property had plans for development, and all of these plans really ultimately failed. It's 60 miles from a community, it's remote. There was no power, it was expensive because it was all diesel fuel. When we bought the place, they were heating the pool with $4,000 every month of diesel fuel. That's how they heated the pool. We're at a hot springs. When I asked Bernie why he wanted to buy the hot springs, he said that it was because of the hot water. And he was convinced that he could do things with the hot water that the state wasn't doing with it. And he was absolutely right. It was said that a low temperature geothermal resource could not produce energy that would be available on a commercial basis. I introduced him to people. He was looking for help. And what he got, first words are, you're too low temperature. It's only 175 degrees Fahrenheit. A really good solid geothermal system is around 300 degrees. He kept hearing, you can't do it there. It's too low temperature. And of course, that, uh, those are fighting words for Bernie. And he just kept, uh, kept at it. Bernie Carl said, nonsense. I think there's a way to do it. He engaged with those who were experts on the subject, and he said, we can have a testing venue at Chena Hot Springs. What we do, our water at 165 degrees isn't hot enough to do much. It's on the inside of the tubes. On the outside is 134A refrigerant. It's at 59 degrees, it turns to a vapor. The vapor goes up to 220 PSI and spins the turbine. The turbine spins at 15,000 RPM, turns the generator, makes electricity. If you think of a circle with all the arrows going the same direction, this is as close to perpetual motion as you're going to find. It's probably, I think, the lowest temperature electrical production spot in the world, or one of them, certainly. Today, two of the revolutionary generators hum around the clock, providing electricity to the entire resort complex. I did away with all the wood. I did away with all the electric. I did away with all the propane and I heat every building on the property with one source, hot water. That's how simple it is. A problem to us is an opportunity. And what they've done at China is being closely watched in Alaska's many remote villages that depend on expensive diesel fuel. That has it would expand sense. greatly the use of geothermal around the world. So this is just the start of a revolution, I hope. I want to be the world's best at geothermal, but I don't want to keep the knowledge for me. I want to share with everyone. Bernie's Energy Fair was a brainchild that he had uh, 13 years ago. The Energy Fair relates to renewable energy, geothermal being one component of that. The Energy Fair is a gathering of like minds who want to learn about sustainability and how to make things better on this planet. It's a gathering of sharing knowledge. After the first energy fair, it was obvious that it was so popular that it needed to continue. And the people that he invites come not only with their ideas, but almost always with a product. China fairgoers got to see a prototype of what's basically a miniature power plant sized for the home. The governor and other Alaskan leaders are interested in its potential. Everybody gets to tour the power plant. Everybody tours the greenhouses. I want to teach people how to be responsible, how 
how they don't have to waste anything. The Energy Fair brings out a lot of heavy hitters. We always have our congressional delegation, both our senators, the congressman, the governor will be here. A lot of people, you know, want to be seen there, but there's reasons why that are not political. It's because the things he does teaches a lot of folks. You can feel the heat here, feel how hot this is. This is the water coming in, this is the water leaving. The people come back here because they know I finished things. Every year there's been something different, and they've always come back. They come here wanting to see what I've done different. They don't care what it is different, they want to see it. You know, they don't want to hear all the bullshit. People are all doubting Thomases. They want to touch, feel, see. So when they come here, they'll be able to not only touch, feel, and see, they'll be able to enjoy. It seems like a lot. <laughs> it seems like a lot when you hear it, when you hear him uh, or read what the list of uh, projects are. So this year, they're going to see a new geothermally heated outdoor patio, new geothermal heated new outdoor spa, a new geothermally heated uh, entrance to the rock lake and to the pool, a brand new wood powered and geothermally heated gazebo. And the project that's most challenging to finish before the energy fair by a, a factor of 10 is putting the DC-6 up on piling. Putting the airplane in the air is one of the biggest projects, one of the craziest projects that we've done out here. What, what exactly do you mean when you say put the airplane in the air? Well, that's just it. I'm not quite sure what it means or how we're going to do it because we don't, we don't know how we're going to do it yet. This plane's gonna be setting right here on this piling. The tail will be back there. The now. projects around here began with Bernie's brain. So that's a 120 foot airplane you're gonna to try to pick up and 120 foot wide and set it on top of the pilot. Bernie's blueprints, I've seen them on napkins. I've seen them drawn in the sand. I've seen them just sketched out on the back of a piece of paper. I mean, that's how his blueprints go. I mean, he was told he was crazy by all kinds of people for even thinking that was going to happen. Where do those big ideas come from? You've known them forever. <laughs> I don't know where he comes up with them. I'll be honest with you. Uh, out of the sky blue. You know, I do have a lot of, some people say crazy ideas. I would like to say interesting ideas. I don't think they're crazy. I think they're interesting. You know? Well, <laughs> There's probably a fine line, yeah. I mean, I don't think I'm certifiably crazy, but, you know, a little different, probably. Well, the first thing that comes to mind with Bernie is uh, he's unfiltered. You can call me crazy, but it doesn't say stupid flashing on and off, does it? No, it doesn't say stupid flashing on and off. Bernie does love to have an audience. You don't have to be the brightest bulb on the tree. You got to be a bulb. The solution to pollution is dilution. He's just loud. He's loud. And I want them to know that they got to use their heads for something other than a hat rack. They can have a bear affair or a bear bear affair. He's a flamboyant and explosive character, and, but you have to look past that in some ways. Some people who are bombastic never deliver. Now, he has delivered on many of the things he's done. One example was with the creation of this Ice Museum Ice Hotel. You got to hand it to him for seeing opportunities where others just see obstacles. So Forbes magazine voted this the dumbest business idea of the year in uh, 2006. We tell her when Forbes can kiss my what Jesus Christ wrote in the Nazareth on, I'm not allowed to say ass. There was lots of news coverage about this great visionary idea turning, you know, dripping away into nothing. Webster's Dictionary says failure is if you don't succeed. Webster is an idiot. Failure is if you don't try. You can never be a failure unless you quit. I saw it as a great opportunity to do it right the second time. Bernie came back and they rebuilt it. I'm moving refrigerated air up to minus 20 below in the evaporator. Never been done before. I'm gonna send Forbes a plane ticket to come see this. You think if I send Forbes a plane ticket, he'll come? It's been a huge, huge 
success. The Ice Museum is one of the biggest revenue earners that we have. It's huge. 8,000 pounds of ice, 600, 600 hours of work. I think he gets a kick out of proving people wrong. You've heard of the Great Wall of China. This is the Great Wall of China. And it's been up now for 12 years. It took a special person, really, to come up with that idea, because most people around here thought he was nuts. Most people, it's unrealistic, some of the things that he wants to do out here. But to him, he believes 100% that it can happen. China is Alaska's only working laboratory. Everything we do here is an experiment. We're a microcosm of the world. We have all the same opportunities the world has to make our own power, grow our own food, build our own roads, handle our own waste, and entertain the public. You're inside the laboratory. You're part of the experiment. We're the future of the world right here. Alaska's the future of the world. I say we do it with one crane. I think one crane will do it. One crane won't do it. And that thing's going to be 50,000 pounds. Yeah. Picked up that far out? Yeah, it's a it's a 70-ton crane. But that's with one stick straight up. Everybody's kind of got an idea how they think that it should go up in the air. And at the end of the day, they'll all bring their ideas together and probably take something from all of them. I mean, because we don't have any kind of blueprint. So when you reach out 60 feet on that radius with that much stick on there, that far, I'd have to go look at that chart on there to see at 60 feet out, how far, you, how much can you lift? You would still be closer than 60 feet. No way. Mm -mm. No, because the center of the aircraft, the center of the aircraft over the wings from the nose is 60 feet. Uh, radius of 65, 21,000 pounds, according to this chart. That's at a 65 foot radius. Yeah. So that won't even come close to doing it. Why he is where he is today is just his his perseverance. He never he never stops thinking. And I mean, it, it's a good thing that he has a lot of us that ground him. You know, that can follow through on a lot of his ideas and his dreams. What I'm saying is, you pull the nose of the airplane right up against its pylon that it's going to go on. You can't do that. You can't get it that far. You got the wings there, right? How far do the wings come out? The leading edge of the wing. Without the, the engine on, it's six foot nine inches from where the engines bolt on to the main wheel. Six foot nine? Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. That. Uh... So you're saying pull that nose all the way up to that. Now your center of gravity is right in the middle of your piling. You were probably thinking I was being hard-headed, but, but when you explain it to me, it all makes sense, you know? That's way better than not explaining it. Bernie makes it very clear that uh, he does not have an extensive educational background he engages with others who are experts in the field. And that's one of the fascinating things to have watched over the years. You know a hell of a lot more about it than I'm ever gonna know, but, but uh, I see what you're saying now. Now I, I got the visual on it, so. Any man that thinks he's a self-made man is a fool, is a fool. There's all these people that have helped you all through life, starting with your parents, teachers, mentors, employers, friends, no one's a self-made man. I was born in Peoria, Illinois, 1952, to a mom and dad and a family of 16 children. One mom and dad who wanted us, 
Now that gives you a leg up in life when you're wanted. My mom and dad were the two hardest workers in the whole world. And so they led by example. You knew you had to help. They didn't have to beat us over the head. My dad not only worked hard at work, he was a photographer for Caterpillar Tractor, but he would come home and every day he was making our lives better. I remember one time he wanted to build a fireplace. We had no fireplaces in our house. He never laid a brick before in his life. He went to the library, got a book, learned how to lay bricks. I'd never done it ever, you understand. But my dad taught us all, if you can read a book, you can do anything. He raised 16 kids that can do anything. If there was ever a problem, it was never about love or food. It was always about there was never enough money to go around. And you wanted to do everything you could to help. And you know, I could give my mom 20 bucks, 30 bucks. It might not sound like a lot today, but it was a lot back then. And I had it. So I started out, I got to go on the milk run in the morning. Why? I was taught to be proud to be a worker bee. I couldn't pick up a can of milk, but I could slide it to the front of the truck. And that saved them a lot of work. And then my Uncle Art, he had a coal truck. He delivered coal. So I always got to go on the coal truck. I'm an eight-year-old shoveling coal. And then we go to the Stockyards Cafe. Now, I've already been on the milk run. Now I'm on the coal run. Now we're going to the Stockyards Cafe to have lunch. Now I'm eight years old and I get to have a little glass of beer with my uncle. A little glass of beer. And I'm thinking I'm 20 foot tall, right? Yeah, eight and 10 years old, typical day. I was just one of these kids that was meant to work. You know, I was meant to work. Good morning. Good morning, how you doing? How about excellent? I've never had a bad day in my life ever. <laughs> I've never had a bad day ever in my life. I've never had a bad day ever. No, I've haven't. never had a bad day in my life ever. Oh, <laughs> I don't have bad days. Never have and never will. I've got a lot of people using my sayings now. And I think a lot of people think about it, you know? You can either have a good day or a bad day. Why not have a good one? And I have five brothers like you know in wheelchairs, so they can't pick up a cup of coffee, comb their hair, so what the heck? It's pretty easy for me, right? It's very easy for me. As you can see, everything is in place. You'll notice that, now I don't care what you look at, every label is gonna be sticking out so you can see it. This is uh, my brother's workshop now. I have five brothers that are in wheelchairs, have muscular dystrophy. They can't pick up a cup of coffee or comb their hair, but uh, there's nothing they can't do. They can build anything. They hire arms and legs uh, to help them. So they usually either have one or two interns uh, all the time helping them. And they get these young kids and they'll get them, uh, they'll be a freshman in high school, uh, work them all the way through high school. And they teach them everything. They'll teach them to weld. They'll teach them to use a cutting torch. And that's why you see this place looks like a park, because uh, he's, he wants it to look like a park. Everything around here, that's, that's you know, it's him. Handicap is a state of mind. My brother's not handicapped because there's nothing he can't do. They trained so many people to lead productive lives. Some of them are electricians now, some of them are welders now. It's just amazing what they've accomplished with their hardship. It's extremely hard for any of the healthy brothers and sisters to be down about almost anything in their life when you think about the brothers and how they stay unbelievably cheerful. Watching my father over the years, as the family grew, he would do more renovations to the home, so he was constantly working. It was really neat to be able to be a part of that over all those years. That's what was instilled on us to work. So it was just something natural, I mean, to just go work and, and then work harder. The first store I ever went to in my life was a hardware store. So it, it was always ingrained many, many years ago that the tool was one of the greatest gifts ever. We've always had this desire to want more tools, build more projects. We never bought anything off the shelf at any store. We made it. So my very first electric wheelchair was made in that 
garage right on the uh, farm property here by my father. He didn't know how to weld, but he read, he learned how to weld. He would come home from work, build our chairs. One unbelievable drive to go work all those hours and then come back and to build those chairs. My handicapped brothers were always thinking out of the box what they could do to be productive, and man, they, they were all extremely productive. Tim, the one of the twins, he had pneumonia a short while back, and he could only move a finger and a thumb before that, but he couldn't even remove his wheelchair then. And so uh, he already had, laying back, plans for a chin drive, and so he got, had people get that out for him, put it on, fine tune it, so now he drives his wheelchair with his chin better than as good as anybody can do with our hand. He runs his computer with a uh, ball cap that's got sensors in it. So, so he's got to think outside the box. He hasn't any choice. I'm going to take that to Alaska. We're building a new museum there. Uh, my brother couldn't pick up a cup of coffee, but he could mow five acres along. There's a 60 inch uh, lawnmower that goes under there. I get all the motivation from my own family. I don't need to be motivated from anyone else. When you have five brothers that are in wheelchairs, there's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't do. They get to live vicariously through you. Everything you do, you share with them. So why not do everything you can the best you can? Let's see, this is 09, what is this? Oh, this is just where we've been, our travels. Chubby little girl. That's you? <laughs> yeah. That's where I grew up. Big old Connecticut farmhouse. See, that was our life. I mean, we had a farm. <laughs> uh -huh. Our cow. <laughs> Our class had 12 people when I graduated from eighth grade. Did you already want to travel at this age? Were you thinking about that yet? No. I uh, just wanted to go around the United States and see it. And rather than just go on a vacation, which people tried to talk me into doing. And I said, no, I wanted to see a place. And the way to see it was to work in the different places. And I had Alaska as the destination. It took me a month to get here because there was a lot of interesting things to see and do. People didn't want me to go traveling on my own. They just didn't think that was a safe thing to do. I had a pickup with a little camper thing on the back and one couple told me that they thought that whoever I was traveling with was in the back while I was driving. So they just assumed I wasn't traveling alone. So that was kind of good. That's amazing. And this is, this is life on the pipeline? Yeah. <laughs> That's you having a good time. Oh, God, don't take pictures of that. This is when Bernie and I first uh, got together on the pipeline. Oh, okay. Look at him there. He looks like a grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> the pipeline construction from 1974 till 77 was, uh, it's just hard to describe today what that was like. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline. 800-mile-long oil pipeline from Alaska's north slope to the southern ice cream port of the It was the most intense construction period, not only in the history of Alaska, but perhaps in the history of the country. There were tens of thousands of workers. The peak employment was above 30,000. And for a state with the population of a small city, that was really an unheard of sort of situation. The city of Fairbanks suddenly sprouted dozens of bars and nightclubs. And like the early gold rush towns, the cities of Alaska were changed quickly and dramatically. 
was larger than any of the gold rushes that had occurred decades earlier. It was the oil rush. And that's what everyone referred to it as. The oil companies had an incentive to do this as quickly as possible because they weren't going to be making any money until oil started flowing. So every day was critical. It was that attitude that allowed them to build this in three years. So from 74 to 77, it was an intense situation here. And this intense period nearly brought people like Bernie Carl here from all over the country. It was a gold rush. It was black gold. It was the black gold rush of the 70s. And it was a gold rush where it got shared with lots of people, 20,000 people, that to stake their claim. When I graduated from college, I had a choice. The pipeline paid over $65,000 per year. The newspaper job was $2,500 per year. It was an easy choice. And like Bernie and many others, I was drawn by the opportunity to, uh, to make some money. The Alaska Pipeline helped thousands of people get their starts. It's the best thing that ever happened to Alaska. It, it put Alaska on the map. In four months, $50 million worth of heavy construction equipment and materials was moved north of the Yukon. The work camps were... So I had an opportunity to go in the pipeline, be a mechanic. Well, am I a mechanic? No, I'm not a mechanic. I mean, I've fixed a lot of things, but am I a heavy-duty mechanic? Not only no, hell no. But I'm the world's best imposter. I changed my age from 20 to 34 because as a 20-year-old, what the heck? You're not going to get anything done. So I filled out the... So now you're 34 years old. Now I had to hurry up and learn a bunch of stuff. Well, my dad taught us to read, so everybody else is reading Playboys and Penthouse, not to tell you I didn't want to. But I traveled with 178 pounds of, they're called yellowbacks. At that time, you could get a yellowback on every piece of equipment Caterpillar had. And every piece that was on the pipeline, I had a yellowback. And I owned them. My dad sent them to me. They didn't belong to the company. They belonged to me. I looked at everything up. I knew, I knew all the torques. I knew all the dimensions. I knew everything about that piece of equipment. And I remembered it. So now I'm, instead of 20, I'm 34. And I got all this knowledge. And then these old timers. I had matters, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. I did their work and I did my work. They showed me every secret. So within a year, within one year, I've got 200 years of experience. The first year I stayed 52 weeks. The second year I stayed 51 weeks. People would work on an eight and two. I stayed. I'm in the best school in the whole world. I'm like getting my PhD in, in mechanics. You know, I'm going to school, I'm getting paid every day to learn and i learned at a rapid rate my god the guy never sleeps uh he's working all the time and he, when he's not working he's in the mess hall entertaining and uh, just this vibrancy that he has uh, constantly comes out these stories would emanate all up and down the line and there were 20,000 people working on the line but there were four or five people that really became infamous and well-known through their reputation. Bernie was one of those. No, it wasn't love at first sight. One night, where there was a party in camp, and I was walking down the hall, and he came by and picked me up and carried me to the party. And I did kind of tell him what I thought of him. I told him that he was a loudmouth jerk. Then he started talking about his family. And when he started talking about his family, I decided, well, you know, this guy isn't so bad after all. The next day we moved in together. And we have never been apart since. I mean, we just knew that we should be together. Well, the pipeline's winding down. I told Connie, I said, uh, I think we should buy one of these mining claims. We'll have the Last Rush Mine. Last Rush Mine, that was the name of it. Came up with it right that day, Last Rush Mine. So Connie and I, uh, the newest adventure was to go gold mining. We bought the claims at minus 40 below zero. We're in town and we bought an Airstream trailer. Like a bird on a tree. That was it, yep. Yeah. Then we just started planning to do things together. 
I got time It's clear to see From up here What I picture when I was 10 was me cutting the trees down, building the log cabin, and that was still in my mind when we went mining, and my wife and I did exactly that. I cut all the trees down, my wife peeled them all, and I cut them, notched them, and stacked them. I lived that dream. It was just an adventure, yes. Forever free. And most women wouldn't do that. They wouldn't get their hands dirty. My wife is wearing a glad garbage bag, because we didn't have raincoat, glad garbage bag, and she's grinding off the hem case on a final drive, and our neighbors are coming down. They've already got 5,000 ounces of gold, and they're done for the year. We haven't even started mining yet, and the neighbor always looks like she comes out of a magazine, you know, and Connie said, would you rather have me look like Gail, or would you rather have my work? I said, sweetheart, get back to work, and she's grinding away. I mean, I mean, this girl was, was a keeper. We actually had part of his family and part of my family working at the mine with us. It was common to move your family out there to mine because someone had to do the cooking and, you know, life goes on. It was, yeah, whole families went mining. It was very enjoyable, actually, because it was a very nice community. Nights, get out of the house. Can you see me through your sadness? We weren't all close together. We had a few neighbors who stayed friends, and some of them are still friends to this day. He had two brothers, a brother-in-law, a sister, who came up that first year that we were mining, and we originally only had the Airstream trailer that we stayed in. So I was resented by his brothers because I had to get them out of the kitchen where they were sleeping on the floor before I could cook their breakfast. We got married at Santa Claus's house. Mrs. Santa Claus married us. We had enough money to either have a party or get a ring. We had the party. It took my wife seven years to get her wedding ring. And in seven years, she got a ring made out of the gold we mined you know, we did it all. We did it together. So what the heck? I mean, I, I won. I won the lottery, the mega lottery, right? In Alaska, it's real simple. People come here because they have a dream. They want to fulfill their dream. Driving up north on the trans Canada Highway. What really brought people to Alaska then and now really is a sense of adventure. They come here looking for opportunities that they haven't seen for themselves elsewhere in the lower 48. Those who decide to stay here, generally speaking, are very hardworking people. They get up in the morning, they go to work. They don't ask for anything that they don't earn. They don't sit around watching TV on the weekends. Uh, they're doers kind of drive into a different world. Yeah, we have internet and we have cable, we have all these things, but we're also so far removed, it creates a real sense of neighborhood because people really have to look out for each other. If you're hitchhiking at 45 below, you pick people up. It's really an acquired taste living in Alaska. You have to live here and know that every day there's a consequence for every one of your actions. You can live in California and you can go pick avocados along the road. Here, if you're going to live off the land, you better consider how you're going to do it. And there's always something trying to kill you. Either the weather, the bears, the rivers, something's trying to kill you. Alaska is a place, it's so extreme, that you either love it or you hate it. So if you hate it, you leave. If you love it, you'll never leave. You'll be here forever. Because they want that excitement. They want that experience. They want that thrill. It's something that's missing that they don't get anywhere else. And they want to experience it. And when you want to experience something that's real, you better come to some place where it's real, and that'll be Alaska. This place doesn't encourage unusual characters, oddball characters, you know, people who are just a little bit different. Everyone comes out of their shell in Alaska. And maybe Bernie came out of his shell and never wanted to go back because the shell was too small. <laughs> 
So, you know, I mean, I, I don't run your corporation, but I'm going to tell you, if I ran my business like you guys run your business, I'd be out of business. I refuse to sit down uh, because you waste a bunch of time. This is my this is my office. You want to talk about recycled? This is a this is a uh, shelf that was out of that bookcase over there, and I taped it on here with tape. This is just box tape, right? And uh, in 1984, I finished up mining. We gold mined for several years. I read a book called Klondike Fever. Bought it for 50 cents over in the Klondike. You read it. And there's only a couple of people that made any money. You could count the miners on one hand. The guys that made the money are either the bars, the houses of ill repute, the restaurants, just a few miners. So I wanted to mine the miners. When we started k, &K Recycling, recycling was not in a dictionary. 1984. Unheard of. He has no fear in terms of getting out in front and pushing a notion, an idea, an ideal. In Alaska, your status is how many wrecked cars you have in your yard, how many wrecked airplanes are in your yard, how many wash machines and dryers are stacked up out back. So why not collect up the metal and figure out how to ship it outside? Now, we're not the brightest bulb on the tree, and it was, it's been a difficult thing. I don't think you would make money just in the scrap business. He's been unafraid to try things and to do risks, you know? He's got lots of good ideas. See, out of 10 ideas he has, two or three of them might be brilliant. Bernie is a man of vision. The trouble is he has too many. You know, because he has so many ideas, not all of them work out and some of them are just kind of abandoned. But he doesn't, you know, you, you will not hear Bernie talk a lot about his failures. I would like to think I'm one of nature's best students. My business program looks right after what nature does. It uses everything. Nature has zero waste. So why would we have waste? There's all these doubting Thomases everywhere. You've got to prove this stuff to people. So that's what we're going to do. That's why it's all here. We're going to prove to you and to everybody else in the world that there is no waste. There is zero waste. When you're talking to Bernie about the projects, you have to kind of prioritize which projects need to get done and in what order they should get done. You know, like the entrance to the pool needs to get done because we need more room. The business is expanding. The airplane, that's a lot of fun. Oh, so they're playing this uh, video of uh, the DC-6 landing here at China. So uh, we're going to take a look at the DC-6. Uh, a lot of people were doubting Thomas's they bet this couldn't be done. That airplane stopped on a dime. Give you a nickel change and we taxied it down here. Reversed the engines and parked it here. So it sat there for one year. So we had to bring that plane, if you can imagine, you pull it through here. We had to cut down four trees here. You can see the tracks coming right through. Pulled it through here and turned it around. Back the airplane into place. And now we have to dig holes and do the piling. Everyone thinks I'm a, a, like a duck on the water. I'm just floating around. Underneath, I'm paddling like hell. I know all the things that need to be done. I still got a lot of work to do in here yet. This all has to be set up. If you follow me around, you'll see that I use all the hours. Hey, what's, uh, what's your status, buddy? Are you, what, time are you, what time are wheels? A half a day on my watch is 12 hours. A 
The full day is 24, and I'll burn up most of the hours. Is this smoky in here, or is it just me? The chairs, every chair needs washed. They're just filthy. If Kayla finds you, she's got a few chores. If you would help her on, you could help her. This is the ice cream. That one looks like it's leaking. Huh. That's not good. This is, uh, well, two items not working. So my job here is to trust but verify. As you can see, kind of total chaos here. Nothing's cleaned up, tables aren't set, and there's just a lot left to do. When they come here tomorrow, the people are going to be wowed. Uh, and they're going to wonder, how in the hell did he do that? And there's a lot of doubting Thomases. Even the people that know what they're doing doubted this. But you can't doubt it now. It's a testament to, uh, to imaginary, imaginary 101. be just for just for china it'll be a conversation piece just as the ice hotel is for the entire state the entire world they give a whole new meaning to to imaginary and to recycling Start the talks right now. You'll enjoy it. It's not. It's not boring. Bring the dogs with you. Put me on a plane. Going the wrong way. You got to listen to a good talk. Everything Bernie does today is is part of the future of Alaska. I mean, the fact that the things that are talked about today, the kind of you know the energy we're talking about, the kind of generation we're talking about. I mean, you don't spend much time here and realize that this is a game changer for Alaska's future. No question. Bernie is is trying to make the world a better place. People have the scale of life all mixed up. They think it's how much money they have, how much things they have. The scale of life is, did my existence on this earth make it better? Did I make it better? Are you making it better today? Bernie's overall goal is to make this place sustainable. And so uh, geothermal it was you know, the start of that. So the next step is to take the waste products and turn them into something useful. It turns out there's a technique to turn waste, human waste and uh, restaurant food waste into uh, methane and water and a usable fertilizer product. I think by the time he gets done with some of those tours, the, the people are like, there's no way he can do this. There's no way he can do everything he just told us he wants to do. But with Bernie, he, you never know what he's gonna be able to pull off. Okay, my vision for the future, and I think I'm right. There'll never be another drought anywhere in the world. There'll never be another famine. Why? Because we can grow enough food to feed the world. I don't care how big the world is in controlled environments. There'll never be another smokestack. Everything going up that smokestack we need. A one acre greenhouse will consume 26 tons of CO2 a day. I see dirigibles flying around built of carbon. I see every item you can think of built of carbon. Carbon is 10 times stronger than steel, 10 times lighter than aluminum. There's 1 billion, 200 million engines, internal combustion engines running in the world right now. All of them will be running on Metro. Metro is you take that four molecules of hydrogen, you take a couple molecules of CO2, and you take a couple molecules of nitrogen, you bond that with the hydrogen, and when you drive around your tank full of Metro, and what do you get for it? You burn one gallon of Metro, you get one gallon of distilled water. It's one to one. You're making water, clean water. I don't care where you're at, where there's a drought, you're driving around, you're making water. You go home and you got 24 gallons of drinking water. 
and you're not polluting the air. No more polluting the air. That's what I see. These are real projects. You want to talk about changing the world, there won't be another smokestack. Think about it, no more smokestacks. And every vehicle's cleaning the air. When you start up, it's cleaning the air. It's cleaning the air. Think about that. All from products that Alaska has. Alaska is going to lead the parade. We're going to lead the parade. Once again, America is going to get its greatness back, but it's going to get its greatness back from Alaska. Seen from miles wide, miles wide, like the moon over the world. 